Welcome editors, authors, and guests to the EOSIS Lorihatis Book Symposium, where Professor Johan Tempelhoff from the Northwest University will present his latest book. The title is South Africa's Water Governance, Hydraulic Mission, 1912 to 2008, in a WEF Nexus context. I am Professor Andries van Aarde, the commissioning editor of IOSIS Scholarly Books, and it is my honor to host you in this session today. A special welcome also to all those who are watching via, via live streaming. A brief introduction of our Lori Hartes book author this year. Professor Johann Nicolas Tempelhoff studied history, political science, and international politics and completed his MA study at the University of Pretoria in history under the supervision of the late Professor F.A. van Jarsveld. His doctoral studies dealt with the history of land tenure in the present-day Limpopo province between 1886 and 1899. In 1979, he served as a junior part-time lecturer in history at the University of Pretoria, between 1980 and 1982, uh, apology, he was a researcher in the Institute for Historical Studies at the Human Science Research Council. Between 1986 and 1989, he was senior lecturer in history at the University of Venda, and appointed as Associate Professor of History at the University of the North. From 1996 until 2005, he began to serve as the Northwest University faculty, in the Northwest University Faculty of History in the Faculty Fall Triangle in Van der Bell Park. In 1998, he became director of the School of Basic Sciences in the faculty of the Fall Triangle. This school is the umbrella for the subject groups of history, political science, public management and administration, philosophy and theology. Johan Tempelhoff is leader of the research group for the cultural dynamics of water in Southern Africa at Northwest University, the Fall Triangle campus. Currently, he is active in the South African Water History Archival Repository, which is home to more than 500 thousand documents of valuable materials related to water studies. Established in 2014 at the Northwest University, the project was seed funded by the Water Research Commission. Johan is the author of several books. His research interests include research methodology, historiography, as well as the environmental and cultural history of water in South Africa. He is married to Elise Tempelhoff, a, and I will say maybe the most, Elise, senior environmental journalist. Uh, in South Africa, 
working at Media24. And you are aware of our current uh, articles in the rubric uh, in the Gauteng magazine, daily ma uh, 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 magazine of Beeld. They have two sons, Johan and Gustav. Johan Tempelhof is currently an extraordinary professor in the School of Social Sciences in the Faculty of Humanities at Northwich University. Again, the Fall Triangle campus. We gives guidance to postgraduate students in water-related resource. It is now my pleasure to ask Johan to come to the podium, and we are at very, very keen. It's our privilege to listen to this expert on water resources in South Africa. Much. Professor <coughs> Van Aude, thank you very much for the opportunity. May I just, as a caveat, say right at the outset, I f fully support the issue or the facet of publishing related to open access publication. It means that the taxpayer has benefit of the groundbreaking research we are doing um, in South Africa. And it's not uh, excluding people. That's very important. And the trend of open access academic publication is gaining significant ground in especially the United States at the Ivy League universities who do not want to pay any longer for taxpayers' research money that is invested to the profit of companies. I also wish to thank the NRF who made available funding in 2014 for me to execute this job and also <laughs> lead a number of students in the field and also th the support of the Northwest University Management for Research because I know they put in extra money on this thick doorstopper of a book and I really appreciate it. It, uh, it was a great privilege. And then specifically the support I received from IOSIS. Um, in the past week, uh, I feel I received more, well, even more attention than I received at the time of my baptism at the Ingekerk Moedergemeente in Benoni, uh, a lot of years ago, because these people really cared for me, and in dealing with me in the book, preparing the book, they were thorough, and they gave excellent support. So I would like you just to give an, a hand to the people who made it possible. Thank you. Right. Now, I'm working from two um, PowerPoints. Uh, I have my iPad with me with extra notes just to give me moral support. I'm for more familiar with, with Apple products than with PC products. Now, the theme is the, war, the WEF nexus, the water energy food nexus in South Africa's water governance in the period 1910 to 2008. Now, um, let me just mention to you there are three theoretical themes that I'm dealing with. The first is the WEF nexus, and then I will deal with resilience. You know, it's a fashionable term in ecological studies at present, uh, at present and I use the Panarchy theory for getting into resilience, and then I speak also in the book about the hydraulic mission. Now, just something about the WEF nexus, we are dealing with the phenomena of, you see, water at the top, energy and food. And since the Greeks have already spoken about nexus in ancient Greece, it's a, let's call it um, a, a, a treasure or a pressure pipe in which you have three uh, resources operating simultaneously. And if one of them collapses, or has a short 
fall, what happens is that the system starts collapsing. And for the purposes of this discussion, we are looking at the government of the day, the climate change, and also to the environment. But you can bring other exogenous role players into play as well. But now what I have done was I have um, sparked the web nexus in different time periods. For example, first we will be looking at the food component of the nexus in the period 1910 to 1942, and then the energy uh, component of the nexus in the period 1942 to about 1990, and then um, uh, finally, from 1990 up to the present, we are in the water nexus era. So uh, just bear that component in mind, that, uh, that framework. Now, I'm working in nexus, uh, in the panarchy theory. It is basically cyclical, but it is infinite. And it has a lot of hermeneutic potential in the sense that no two... Uh, trends in the uh, cycle are identical. And if you see, we have smaller and rapid processes of uh, uh, infinity cycles, then it leads to revolt. Whereas if we have gradual development and sustained growth and processes going on, we find remembrances, historical consciousness, and social consciousness, uh, settling in with people, having a memory, society having a memory of how we used to do things. And this enables us to operate in a sustainable and in a resilient manner. So theoretically, that is my background. It is related to the ecological sciences, but I found it very useful in the humanities as well. And then finally, the hydraulic mission. It is a nice learned term uh, uh, that I explore uh, to some extent in the book. And it deals with the manner in which a governance authority, like the Department of Water and Sanitation, or the government of the day, chooses to prioritize the use of its water resources. And this study deals all with the way in which the government and the Department of the National Department of Water dealt with water in the period 1910, basically, up to 2008. Right, let's start with the irrigation food component of the nexus between 1910 and 1942. Now, the Union of South Africa that came into existence in 1910 was the product of two British colonies as well as two Afrikaner republics that joined forces. And there were also indigenous communities who mainly were ignored in the process of unification, but they were absorbed into society and the economic development and in relative social isolation. Now, at the time of union, irrigation was a fairly new uh, technology, and we're talking about modern irrigation, which had its prime roots in the United States Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, and especially in Western California. And that technology came over to South Africa, and we started using it in the Department uh, of Irrigation, as it was called. That's the, the previous name of the Department of Water Affairs. So you get an impression of how dedicated they were to irrigation. Now, for South Africa's farming sector, that was a breakthrough period because the government was seeing to it that the population was provided with food supplies. And the legislation they issued was also measure, uh, meaningfully the Irrigation and Water Conservation uh, and Conservation of Waters Act of 1912. Then World War I broke out in 1914. Most of the water workers went uh, to their war effort. They served in, uh, especially in German West, uh, Southwest Africa and also overseas. Uh, during this time, co the construction of Lake Mens, one of the prime projects of the Department of Irrigation, started. And 
after World War II, there was a serious drought, but also a worldwide depression, which affected South Africa, along with the outbreak of the flu pandemic. Also, we find that the uh, groundwork for South Africa's industrial uh, development was laid. Already in 1915, 1916, Generals uh, Boeta and Smuts negotiated about the plans of getting an uh, electricity supply commission on the go in South Africa. Unfortunately, at the time, as a result of the outbreak of the war, that could not materialize. Now, just to give you an impression, this is a massive dam in the arid northern Cape, and it was constructed by the smart syndicate. So the private sector was also busy with dams, and you can see they use very rudimentary tools, but that was the practice of the day. But it was a private uh, initiative, and that contributed to significant agriculture in one of the arid regions uh, of South Africa, especially in the uh, irrigation sector. And there is one of the first uh, monuments of the Department of Irrigation, Lake Mentz on the Sundays River, it was completed basically in 1924, and it was the hallmark of the type of work that the de department was capable of producing. And at the time, 1925, the, the Hartbeer's Poor Dam was still under construction in the Crocodile River, and once it was completed in 1926, this dam became the largest dam in South Africa, uh, South Africa's interior. And uh, it re remained like that until the late 1930s. Now, after the war with the Depression, we find there was some industrial development. First of all, in 1922, the government established the Electricity Supply Commission. And in 1928, the Iron and Steel Corporation of South Africa. The reason was private sector was not strong enough to fund this. Our mining sector was very strong, but it was an industry chasing profits and they had to employ a lot of people. So uh, government came out in support of very important infrastructure services. In 1924, the PAC government of J.B.M. Herzog of the National Party and the Labour Party came to power. And the major problem that they faced was poverty. In fact, in 1928, with support from the United States, the first Carnegie Commission was appointed. And it was uh, run from the University of Stellenbosch. And by 1933, the government had a very good idea about how to deal with the poor whites. In the 1970s and 1980s, Go, the, the future government of South Africa would give support to the second Carnegie Commission that gave attention to uh, the people of color in South Africa and their po state of poverty. But in the 1920s, it was the whites. At the time, 1930-33, there was a worldwide depression, and we followed suit to the Americans and we invested, the Department of Irrigation invested a lot of money in dam construction and the development of irrigation schemes because you could push the poor whites into these schemes and let them build government construction at a very good rate. And at the same time, it was all about uh, community upliftment. And that period, the 1930s, we find the second golden period of South Africa's dam construction. And then, unfortunately, war broke out in 1939, and that dampened the activities of the government, because at the time they had some very good plans. Just to give you an impression here, in the background, you see the construction of the Mariku Bosfell Dam, and there are some many other projects, especially in the Cape, and in parts of Transvaal, where poor whites were working, also in, in what is today KwaZulu-Natal, and they were educated. They received education. Uh, they also had uh, a, a literally free lodging, and they received food, and they were educated. They could go to university and further their formal education, and many of them 
became farmers on irrigation schemes in, in South Africa. So that was one way of eradicating the poverty in the rural parts of South Africa. Now, um, the other major scheme uh, was the Farhart scheme. Uh, about three th uh, 300 kilometers south, uh, downstream of the Vaal River, uh, this is the Vaal River that you see here under construction in the 1930s, between 1933 and 38. Um, the Vaal Dam was constructed to provide water to the Vaal Art Scheme, the largest irrigation scheme in the southern hemisphere up to the present. And uh, the Vaal Dam was a multi-purpose dam because a large part of its supply was intended for industrial development in the urban areas uh, of the Witwatersrand. So it was not just an irrigation dam. Now, um, the Industrial Energy Hydraulic Mission, remember I spoke about the other component of the WEF nexus, the energy component started kicking in in 1942, although we have traces of discussions in government and the Smuts government and even under Herzog already starting up in 1937, uh, the outbreak of uh, World War II dampened this uh, new hydraulic mission, uh, but in 1942 we see the first signs of the um, the way government was thinking with the development of the water transfer scheme from the Breda to Saldana, a strategic naval base that uh, had to uh, uh, secure water for passing ships. But the water scheme, the water transfer system was a multi-purpose water transfer scheme. And that is the way in which South Africa would develop in the water sector in the years to come. The Smuts government gave a lot of support to industrialization, and especially in the field of research. In 1945, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, the CSIR, was founded in Pretoria, and in the uh, uh, part and parcel of the, the, the research being done there uh, was in the uh, future uh, National Institute for Water Research. It was a startup established within the CSIR in uh, 1948, and it made a significant contribution, especially in the field of wastewater treatment, which was a critical issue. Now, the water consumption platform, communities, water stakeholders consuming water in all parts of South Africa increasingly broadened. And in 1947 to 1956, we see that the Val River scheme that was originally intended just for the Witwatersrand and for the uh, the uh, Far Art scheme now started focusing water on the Free State gold fields at Valcom and also at Sassel's first plant in Sasselberg in the Northern Free State in 1950. In 1956, we find the passing of the uh, uh, South African Water Act, and it laid down very interesting guide rules for um, uh, monitoring water and for management uh, of water and law enforcement strategies. Now, the Industrial Energy Hydraulic Mission was influenced by the African decolonization that started in the late 1950s, or actually the mid-1950s, and this was driven in turn globally by the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. In South Africa, we have manifestations of that surge and the urge for multiracial or interracial democracy in the issuing of the Freedom Charter of 1955, and then the shocking event of uh, the Sharpeville Massacre uh, on the 21st of March, 1960. What happened was, ever since the 1950s, the, the energy demands were growing. Uh, the cities were growing, populations were enlarging, and there was a need for development. And then all of a sudden, in 1958, they started this drought situation. And the authorities did not know how it was going to contend with uh, the demand for more water in various parts of the country. 
At the time, there was a fashion in southern Africa, many of the colonial areas, and we're thinking here of um, southern Rhodesia, uh, they started the Kariba Dam, very smart, but it was a hydroelectric system that was introduced there. And in neighboring Mozambique, they started with plans for the Kabora das uh, Basa scheme. So the apartheid government, uh, for Wood did not want to stand behind, and they started with plans on the Orange River, River Development Project. And it, it was a project that had been uh, in the pipeline for probably at least 30, 40 years before it started reaching its maturation in the late 1950s. And between 1972 and 78, that project was completed. Now, just to give you a visual impact, this is Sir Ernest Oppenheimer and some of his associates at the what was just the, the platform of the sta uh, station of the future Valcom, very early after the, the gold had been discovered there. And there is um, the Sharpville Massacre. Sorry, the date is 1960, not 1961 as it appears on the slide. Now, the drought was an overwhelming emotional experience for South African society. Uh, we had examples of depression, people committing suicide because they did not have sufficient water. Water scarcity set in at a previously unexpected rate. And this type of poster, which dates actually back to the 1970s, was commonplace in all parts of the country. It featured on walls and in businesses, at schools, where people could see the message that was conveyed. Now, the schemes that uh, realized in this period was the Kharib Dam, the HF Wood Dam previously, and also the Van der Kloof Dam, which previously was the PK Leroux Dams. Both were hydroelectronic dams that could produce uh, hydropower, but they were able to produce water for Central South Africa and also for what was considered to be the water-stricken uh, Eastern Cape. Right. Now, the peak of the industrial energy hydraulic mission started with water transfer schemes. So what was started down in Saldana Bay was, taken on, uh, was taking on a very comprehensive format, and this was probably the peak years of South Africa's water sector development. Up in the, the Drakensberg, in the cool Drakensberg Mountains, they started uh, a water, water transfer schemes, and the Drakensberg Hydropower Project was initiated, and especially the Stadtfontein Dam, which is actually, it covers a smaller water, a surface area than the Val Dam, but it's deeper, and it's in an area where there's not, there's not a lot of water uh, uh, evaporation high up in the mountains. And that is uh, the Val Dam security latch. If all things go wrong, that is our prime supplier of water, even up to the present. And that is the Stadtfontein Dam that emerged from that. Remember, 1973, there was an energy crisis after the Yom Kippur War, and the Arab states did not want to provide South Africa uh, with energy because we were part of the Western Alliance, and the South African government resorted to boosting Sassel, and from that came Sassel II and Sassel III in what is today Mpumalanga. And to make matters worse, from 1978 to 1987, we had a further drought. And that actually stimulated resilience. And it promoted the construction of very interesting dam projects, like the Stadtfontein Dam that you see in that picture. And this is the Drakensberg Pump Storage Scheme at, uh, at the time of the 2008 uh, upgrade, just for your information. They generate power from this during rush hours uh, when there's a great demand for water. And in off-peak times, they pump water into the Stadtfontein Dam. And from there, the, 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 the Stadtfontein Dam, they transfer the water into this uh, turbine and it, or the turbines and they, they generate power for South Africa or parts of South Africa um, 
uh, in this field. It's becoming more and more important with modern day dam construction. And there you see the Palmit Hydro Power Scheme in the Wattentots, Holland Mountains in the Western Cape. And the technology or the technological experience we gained with the construction of the Orange River Scheme as well as with the Drakensberg was all pumped into this project in the Western Cape that which is still running very good. Just to show you how smart those people were in the 1980s, the Hrutrai Dam was constructed to provide power to Sassel 2 and 3 and also to the uh, mines and the power stations in the eastern Transvaal. And then when uh, the uh, drought became a disaster, government initiated a program to start building weirs into the river, the Hrutrai River, which runs into the Val Dam. And these weirs, it's a, a set of seven weirs, were built to pump water back into the river, uh, 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 literally take a river into reverse gear in order to feed into the Hrudrai Dam if they were to run out of uh, water. So it was all about water security. Now, if you look at it from an engineering perspective, it is magnificent. It's a marvelous, it's a, a genius idea. But from an environmental perspective, it suggests um, uh, human uh, dominance over nature, which is not always good for nature. But this gives you an impression of the water that had to be provided just to Sassel 2 and 3. And that is in 1982, a factory about the size of a, a large town. And that is one of the places that needed water during the critical drought period. Now we move on further. I don't have enough time to go into greater depth on many themes, but the Social Ecological Hydraulic Mission of South Africa started more or less in 1994. Its beginnings go back to 1990, 91, up to the present. And the principle is that we are all entitled to clean drinking water and an environment that is not harmful to our health. Th that is included in the, 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 the um, uh, human rights clauses of the, uh, the Constitution of South Africa of 1996. Now, the transition to the new South Africa was the result of the collapse of the East-West divide. There was no longer a communist uh, bloc and a capitalist bloc in the world. And the Cold War came to an end. And in this process, a phenomenal person, Nelson Mandela, was released from per, uh, prison after incarceration for 26 years uh, because of his political standpoint and uh, not wanting to um, steer clear of uh, violence. And then... Negotiations started at CODESA, and many of us who experienced that realized that the onset of the new South Africa was at hand. And behind the scenes, there were a group of water workers, and I spend a considerable amount of the book on this group, the Standing Committee on Water Supply and Sanitation, because between 1991 and 1995, this uh, committee of very, uh, with a commission, a very important key role players in the water sector, future water sector of South Africa, planned how to deal with some of the conundrum that we had. For example, the principle of the new government was everybody must have rights to access to water and supply, water supply and sanitation. At the time, in 1994, six million people Primarily whites had access to uh, water and sanitation services, the best in the world. And 39 million South Africans did not have access to uh, proper services. Uh, the total population was 39. So let's say it was about 30, 30, uh, let's say 30, uh, 2 million people. 12 million people had no access to water, especially in the rural areas, and 21 million had no access to sanitation services. 
Now, the government's reconstruction and development program between 1994 and 1999 was responsible for addressing that issue, especially in the water sector, the presidential lead projects, placed a lot of fina uh, financial support into the hands of the Department of Water and Affairs and Forestry, and they were responsible for building up South Africa's um, uh, record in terms of being compliant with greater access to water for all South Africans, as well as sanitation. In 1999, Mr. Tabu Mbeki took over from uh, uh, President Mandela, and he favored the free market approach. And within the ruling alliance, there was a lot of dif differences of opinions. There were lots of Marxists and socialists who thought that using the free market is no good. We have to have government support in a lot of things. But in this period, we also see the emergence of civil society. And... Um, Mariette Lieferink of the Federation for um, uh, uh, the Sustainable uh, Development. She is here today, but she was one of the people in civil society, and she's a member of the South African Water Caucus. Civil society organizations try to reign in government. At the same time, they try to take a stand uh, against the extremist stands of other um, uh, NGOs in South African society and the populace of South Africa ultimately benefited from that. During the period 1994, we had two pieces of groundbreaking reb, uh, um, uh, legislation that was passed, the Water Services Act. It was re uh, related to how the water services had to be managed and the National Water Act of 1998, which addressed the issue of South Africa's water resources. Then in 2000, 2001, we introduced the principle of free water, six kiloliters of water, free of all, free of charge for every South African family. In essence, the reasons, the whole motivation behind it was the outbreak of cholera in KwaZulu-Natal in 2000, 2001, and uh, a lot of people died. And that was the first outbreak since the 1920s in South Africa of cholera. Just think, after 2008, how many times we have read news about cholera outbreaks within South Africa. So um, free basic water does serve a, a purpose, but if you speak to water managers, they tell you that's preferably not the way to go. But let's form a, a backflash impression. In the early 1990s, there was a drought, and for the first time, departmental officials engaged with communities asking them, would it be in order if we give you a, a borehole here or if we construct a dam here? Can we help you with sanitary services? So the ordinary people at grassroots level, especially in the rural parts of the country, were consulted when the government started offering them services. And there is Professor Kala Asman on the right-hand side. He was the first Minister of Water Affairs and Forestry, and he uh, was instrumental in the legislation that followed um, in 1997 uh, and 1998. And this was at the at, uh, unveiling of one of the presidential lead water projects. Now, in the uh, book, I go into extensive detail into the evolution of the Department of Water Affairs and Forestry, as it was called at the time, and they went through tumultuous changes because, uh, first of all, in the New South Africa, it had to be con consolidated, and I think Dr. Roberts would be able to tell you precisely how many uh, water affairs officials there were people from the homelands and all the provinces were in the mix and then followed a, a, a management roadshow throughout South Africa where the management of the department communicated with um, water workers in all parts of the country. And then we saw the gradual transition 
internally, and there was a, ra a rationalization going on. Many people were passed out of the system, and there was also a process of democratization, and we find the first people of color uh, moving up the ranks into the management of the department of what is today the Department of Water and Sanitation. So it was a period of tumultuous change in the period up to 2008 that I deal with in the book. Just as a conclusion, now let us talk about the WEF nexus. Remember, we have spoken now about water. From 1994, it has become very predominant because uh, we all have a democratic right of access to water and also, there is an ecological reserve. There must be at least 20% of the water in rivers. And w the department can't uh, go counter to that arrangement. So there, that is what I would like to call the social ecological water component of the nexus. Um, and it was also uh, an, a period uh, especially after 1994, that showed us how important security is and the need for resilience, especially with growing evidence about uh, climate change and uh, us needing to prepare for that. One of the outstanding achievements was the development of the Lesotho Highlands Water Project. It was passed in apartheid South Africa in 1986, the agreement between South Africa, the apartheid government, and the uh, mountain kingdom of Lesotho. And the project kicked off in 1997, and the gentleman who will speak after me, he was one of the key role players in, uh, in uh, making it possible. Uh, the project was completed in 2004. And then since 2014, we have been working on the next phase of the Lesotho Highlands Water Project. And it was originally scheduled for 2020, and now we are moving into the space of 2025. Now, let me just give you one example from the apartheid era. I think they always managed the system with uh, a belt and braces. Uh, engineers, if you know them, uh, especially civil engineers working in the water sector, they are su super security conscious, and they would not compromise the security of water. And the new generation of South African water workers are learning this, uh, but we need to give attention to it because we have a legacy of not being able to cope with crises like droughts, like floods. In the case of the Western Cape, Gauteng, KwaZulu-Natal, Northwest Province, the Northern Cape, and especially the Western Cape. And you know how finite our source resources are, our water resources are, when they started talking about day zero. In the richest, wealthiest, and most famous African city, um, it, it, the penny dropped, I think, for more than one um, a, a politician and water worker in the country. And also add to that the recent crisis we have with uh, the Val River becoming a sewage um, a pit. And it's something that needs to be addressed. These are the things that we need to look at. I'm not saying that we were better at it in the old South Africa, but I, uh, I think that we need to create a greater sense of urgency, in the, uh, the hydraulic mission that we need to pursue for the future. And one way of doing that would be dealing with the water, energy, and food nexus. It's a very practical idea, and it touches you and me. You and I, we daily, we use food, we new, uh, use energy that we generate, pro that we receive from ESCOM or from solar power, and we, we're using food, uh, energy, and water. Water is the probably the most important fluid, at least in my view, of um, our existence uh, in society. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to share my ideas with you, and I'd gladly respond to questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Lurika, uh, for the technical support and uh, only a preliminary word then for, of uh, gratitude to Johan uh, for his presentation. Uh, we will move uh, directly to uh, the comments of uh, Dr. Paul Roberts and afterwards there will be uh, opportunity for a few questions uh, session. Um, it is on my privilege actually to introduce to you uh, Dr. Paul Roberts. Paul Roberts, a civil engineer, retired at the end of March 2003. Um, from the then Department of Water Affairs and Forestry, after a career of some 42 years in water resource management. During a period of some 20 years in the management group of the department, he had a broad contact with other countries on various water commissions and committees. Major international contact was made with neighboring countries during the planning and implementation of the Lesotho Highland Water Project and the Komati River Basin Development. The successful conclusion of the tripartite Inku Maputo Agreement between South Africa, Mozambique, and Swaziland in 2002 was a significant career milestone in the life of Dr. Paul Roberts. During the first part of his career, he had extensive experience in the design and construction of water projects. Dam safety considerations played an important role throughout his career. During the period in management, he was responsible for the statutory dam safety office of the department. He was involved in a number of major flooding events of towns and agricultural areas and compiled reports on remedy and mitigation measures. He has a broad experience in governance issues of water management institutions. Paul is of water manage Paul is internationally renowned with regard to water resource matters, served on the technical committees of the Global Water Partnership, chairperson of the Committee of on Shared Rivers of the International Commission of Large Dams, honored be to be the honorary member in 2016, and since his retirement, he has remained active in the World Meteorological Organization, the World Bank, and Global Water Partnership. I do not think we have a more expert in our midst in South Africa to comment on this excellent, wonderful work that Juan Templer did. Paul, thank you so much to accept our invitation to be the commentator. Thanks very much. <laughs> Professor Van Arder, ladies and gentlemen, many years ago my daughter, when she was little, asked me, Dad, when were you born? In my reply, I thought it was better to relate it to an event rather than a date, and I said that I was born just a few days after the start of the Second World War. Um, she looked at me with her big eyes and said to me, Gee, Dad, you were born in history. <laughs> um, in view of that remark, I consider that I have established my historical credentials uh, with you. I really appreciate um, this opportunity to be able to respond uh, to Johann Tempelhof 
Um, we have had an association now for something like over five years, primarily on the issue of the water archive, which is housed at the Fall Triangle campus of the Northwest University. I went through the process of transferring my water activities of some 57 years, as you can see in the slide, um, and eventually that was uh, transferred onto a small little compact disc, which is really accessible and really great and frees up a lot of space. Um, so it's really excellent to have such a compact uh, resource of information. Um, Professor van Arda has given you an excellent introduction of Johan, and I'd like to add a few additional insights. Water and its governance features very strongly in Johan's career and his CV. He has operated both on a national and an international uh, level. I do believe that a key factor in his success in this field is his dedication and enthusiasm. I've noted that despite a significant shortage of funds, uh, that he was able to continue with the water archive, although at a somewhat layer, lower rate of activity and at personal expense. I do hope that the water authorities who have been approached by Johan in recent times uh, for financial support will be forthcoming in the funding of the water archive as we, as a nation, cannot afford to lose valuable knowledge. If we do, we end up by reinventing the wheel and repeating past mistakes. Some of the key aspects that you've seen in the book, and I've put it in a slightly different format, but you've seen the different phases, water for irrigation, then water for energy, industry and urban development, then water for water supply, the sanitation, environment, and meeting international um, obligations. These phases really highlight and imply that the water sector is not static, but is subject to change over time. As an engineer in the applied sciences, we always examine how specific knowledge is applied in practice. I've gone through Johann's publication and consider I'd like to touch on three major areas, namely professional skills, management of water resources, and financial management. I will discuss each of these in turn and mention how historical information contained in the book can assist decision makers both now and in the future. Firstly, we'll deal with uh, professional skills. We have seen ample evidence in recent times that there has been a drastic decline in the quantity and quality of professional skills in state departments and in state-owned enterprises. The water sector is not an exception to this problem. As our water resources become more developed and utilized, we need a greater skills base and innovation. The book by Johan reflects a number of cases of exceptional professional skills and innovative activities. And I'd like to mention a few activities. In the 1930s, South Africa did not have a comprehensive topographical map of the whole country. The then director of irrigation, Mr. A.D. Lewis, undertook the mammoth task 
of preparing one in 500,000 topographical maps of the country within a record period of four years. Nowadays, we are so used to um, instant mapping information on GPS, on our phones, uh, Google mapping, etc. During the 1960s, while I was undertaking the reconnaissance of dams in the former Eastern Transvaal uh, for water transfer to power stations, Eskom power stations, I too experienced a lack of detailed mapping information as the 1 in 50,000 series by TRIG surveys was not complete. I can therefore well appreciate the huge impact that a set of consistent maps of the country had in the 1930s on the planning and implementation of water projects and other infrastructure at that time. During the 1940s, my second cousin, Colonel D.F. Roberts, developed a device on the spillways of dams for the dissipation of energy of the overflowing water. This is now known as the Roberts Splitter and was first installed on the Lost Corp Dam. Since then, it has been developed further and has been applied internationally. Uh, these sh slides show the Blader of Fiespoor Dam and then later the Kharip Dam where modifications were made to the splitter design which allowed for a greater overflow. Um, the skills, yeah, then um, during the 1960s, there was a very large development of dams and many innovative dams were designed and constructed in-house. The department built up skills, especially in arch dams design, and many innovative dams were built during this period. This skills base was an important factor during the planning and implementation of major projects such as the Orange River Project, the Lesotho Highlands Water Project, and the Kamati Development Project decades later. A major concern I have related to the skills in the current Department of Water and Sanitation is the high turnover of personnel and the relatively short term of office of senior management. Major water projects take several decades to plan and implement, and continuity of skilled personnel is essential. The book highlights the continuity of such senior me members, such as Lewis, who served as head for 20 years. You may ask, is this too long? Um, the last director general of the department to serve a reasonable period uh, was Mr. Mike Muller, who served for eight years, retiring at the end of August 2005. Unfortunately, since then, the department has had a series of DGs and acting DGs who have not served for much longer than one year. I'm sure that you will agree that this is not a healthy situation for any organization is something that requires urgent and firm political control at the highest level. The book emphasizes the staffing of the water department and the reader will see that it waxes and wanes. Some low levels of skills and numbers were experienced at times and remedial steps were taken to rectify the situation. Please note that I refer, uh, I do not uh, refer only to engineering skills, but to a wide spectrum 
of professions needed for the management of water resources. During the 1970s, the then Minister of Water Affairs, Farney Boerter, went on a large recruitment drive via the allocation of study bursaries, which was highly successful and resulted in the development of a strong professional team. The last remaining members of this group are now on the point of retirement, which highlights the long-term benefits of such initiatives. The management of water resources I'd like to touch on now includes aspects such as the development of infrastructure, water quality management, the water cycle, and environmental um, issues. I think we all know that South Africa is an arid country and is subject to extreme droughts and floods. Water resource systems need to cater for such extremes. The book indeed does cover uh, this particular issue. During the severe drought of the 1980s, I was responsible for the management, uh, drought management of the Fall River system, which you see here. And Um, and you'll see the system has a series of dams and very complex inflows and outflows, transfers in, transfers out, return flows, etc. Uh, Lesotho, Starkfontein, etc., all shown there. Um, at that particular stage, we had only the historical flow record of some 60 years in the Fall River system. This is a histogram showing the annual inflows um, of in millions uh, of cubic meters versus time. And you'll see it's very peaky, uh, low flows, high flows. In fact, the peak flows can be something like four times the volume, four times the average flow of the Fall River. Um, so, as the drought progressed in this period, we received, in 1981, the lowest flow on record. And we drew Fall Dam down to very low levels. It was something like 10, 15 percent. Um, and we really thought we had reached the minimum. But lo and behold, in the very next year, we got one figure which was even lower. So luckily we did have the Stackfontein Dam as a, a supply and we were also looking at, uh, we had that emergency scheme that Johan mentioned, the Grootdraai emergency scheme and also looking at pumping water out of the Dolomites for the Johannesburg Pretoria region. Um, so these were desperate times and we Finally, the drought broke, uh, floods here, that emergency scheme was washed away, and things returned then to normal. But following that experience, the department uh, invested a lot of money in a large systems model uh, of the Fall River system, which could generate what is called synthetic hydrology. And this is hydrology which has the same characteristics as um, the historic uh, hydrology. This way you could run the system through the model and test it and get a good quantitative result of what is the probability of this event, this extreme event, happening again. Um, and in fact, we used that particular system then for both operating and planning uh, future augmentation for the file system. And has now been applied uh, to other systems such as the Western Cape, etc. cetera. Um, but the cost of the investment, which was very many millions of rand, has been repaid many times by the savings 
uh, in proper water management. But unfortunately, of late, I see there's been a declining use of that particular system, and that links back to the previous point of diminished skills base, both in the public sector and also the private sector. So it's something that we really do need to improve on. Water quality is mentioned in throughout the book uh, for both surface and groundwater. And in the 1980s, I remember Professor Will Alexander who mentioned that water quality will in future be more of a constraint than water quantity. Um, if it's unfit to drink, you can't drink it. Um, and this prediction has become a reality in view of issues such as acid mine drainage and increased uh, poor quality effluent returns to the river due to dysfunctional local authorities. The current water quality crisis of the Fall River is a very good example. The book highlights various changes in uh, governance of the water sector and related changes in legislation. I note there was something like 40 years between the first act and the Water Act of 56, and likewise another 40 odd years uh, with the two new Water Services Act and the National Water Act. Um, I find it at the moment rather disturbing that the Department of Water and Sanitation is intent on consolidating these two acts. Um, the implementation, and I've been through it, of a new act requires a lot of energy, both from the officials of the department and also the uh, private sector. And I consider that it would be far more efficient to first amend the current acts and then implement them. So um, this is something to take forward. The management of water resources implies that we must have timely implementation or augmentation of supply. Uh, Johannes talked about the security aspects. We talk about, in engineering terms, the assurance of supply. Um, augmentations take more than 10 years to implement, and at the moment, the Lesotho Project Phase 2 is about 10 years behind the previously projected uh, schedule. Other metropolitan areas such as Durban, Maritzburg, Cape Town are in a similar uh, predicament. So there is a very large potential for severe water restrictions and my feeling is we really need to align the political decision makers and the professional supporting teams uh, within the departments. Financial management um, is discussed throughout the book and in sort of current terms, the numbers are very small when you relate it to pounds, you know, 60 years ago, but then it was very real problems. And there are many useful lessons we can draw uh, from history. Currently, the Department of Water and Sanitation has a huge deficit um, in respect of its sales of bulk water. I understand this deficit has been accumulating for about a decade. Various institutions such as water boards, water user associations, local authorities, and individuals are responsible for this deficit. I consider this is really a national problem, as we've also seen with the Eskom situation. Some of the deficit can be ascribed to the culture of non-payment of services. 
many communities consider that water should be free as it comes from nature and fail to realize the costly infrastructure is required for its storage, treatment, and distribution. So, Chair, just in conclusion, the research work by Johann Tempelhof is clearly applicable to current water management. Johann and his team of researchers need to be congratulated on an excellent product and in particular for this award. Um, I trust that this response will stimulate further discussion. Thank you. Friends, we have a few minutes uh, still available for us for a question or two. Um, we are scheduled uh, to end the live st streaming at uh, 2.30. Um, and therefore, if there are any one of you who would like to maybe uh, put a question uh, or make a remark to uh, either uh, Johan or Paul, you are mostly welcome to do that. Please. We love these initiatives and especially the integrity and the dedication uh, and the impartiality with which the research had been done. So first of all, from civil society, we owe you a, a great gratitude. Uh, I just want to ask all of these challenges that have been discussed, but in the view, in your expert opinion, and with a historical background, what would you consider to be perhaps the most challenging uh, or the most significant challenge with regards to our water security? Would it be the lack of political will, the lack of skills, professional skills, or financial resources? Would it be perhaps the lack of enforcement to enforce the polluted base principle that is by failing to uh, address the pollution from source? Or would it perhaps be the failure to address like the management of mine water by looking at innovative and embryonic technologies and not focusing only on the high um, um, energy and high cost treatment options? Um, and I would like your, perhaps, uh, attention also to the dysfunctional wastewater treatment work. So, if, in your expert opinion, what should be addressed first? Johan, will you please try to see, only for the live streaming purpose, please. Right. Um, uh, first of all, as a historian exploring uh, the, the, the history of water in South Africa, what stood out for me was that the people involved in working in the uh, water sector were dedicated. So um, I think what we need is integrity. We need to uh, have confidence in our water suppliers and we need a great amount of dedication to address the problems as they arise. And when I look at the history of South Africa, all the issues that you have m m uh, mentioned and the need for technological innovation, they come of themselves. They, uh, we have lots of uh, expertise and we have a long history of expertise. Those areas, those problems will be dealt with by any given generation, but you need a dignity and you need a dedication, you need a passion when you are working with water, when you are working with energy or when you are working with food production, because it takes a very specific type of person to make that key contribution and a whole society revolves around that. If I can mention one problem that we are facing that is imminent and needs addressing, it is climate change. 
We are going to run out of water resources. Within the, by 2030, we are going to sit with major water problems. Despite the Lesotho Highlands Water Project scheme coming into place, and we will learn, we will have to learn how to individually respect water by using less water. We will start uh, purifying water and reusing more water more than we ever did before. We are living in one of the 30 driest countries of the world, and we want to have a first world uh, 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 economy running. And that cannot happen without the will, the dedication, and the integrity of a department that is not after uh, making profits. It is in the service of the public, and we have to get the, uh, uh, the mentality of a ridiculous materialism in the leadership of our country away in the direction of a more principled approach in the service of a wonderful society. Paul, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I agree with Johan. Um, although there's no one single item, it's a, it's a whole matrix of uh, actions that are required. But I th do think a key element is the question of your management skills uh, within the department, the continuity, the dedication, um, and the implementation. We've got the, we've got the acts uh, etc. We've got the power, we've got the Water uh, Services Act. Uh, the local authorities must uh, bring their uh, activities in and do their thing, etc. The Department of Water and Sanitation must monitor, regulate, etc. Uh, just on the question of water, we've got lots of water. We've got the sea. We can desalinate, but our constraint is money. We could not afford to desalinate and irrigate fall hearts with desalinated water. So there is a limit from an uh, economic perspective of how much water we've got. We can always reallocate water between sectors, and one sees this over time. Again, application of the Water Act. So yes, there's a lot to be done, and it gets more and more difficult. Um, I, many years ago, I was asked what population could South Africa sustain with its available water resources? And we came up a figure of 80, 80 million uh, people. Yesterday, I heard the former statistician general uh, talking about 70 million that the population of South Africa should peak at. So it's sort of the same ballpark, but it's going to provide huge constraints on water allocations, return flows, water quality, etc. <coughs> Friends, uh, we are actually now uh, uh, going to end our session, but uh, let me give uh, our friend there a, a last opportunity, and then I will ask Dr. Pierre de Villiers. Uh, who, uh, no, lady, not because ladies are first, but because I am always first for ladies. The issues that we find in the supply of electricity, how connected are they with the, with the supply of water? Is, is that crisis in the electricity sector not going to impact our ability to, to supply water? especially with the transfers from one area to the other. It's, yeah, concerning. Uh, absolutely, uh, you are completely right. Uh, we only started getting onto the uh, renewable energy bandwagon in about 2008, at the time of the first collapse of the web nexus component of energy. Uh, water started with Cape Town in 2017, 2018. If we are able to just replace the power stations with solar energy panels so that they can feed into the grid, 
we will stop using a lot of water, especially in the Mpumalanga region. So immediately we will be in for a, a, a lot of saving. We're not completely going to address the problem. And what is extremely important is that we have to accept, and I'm not, I'm not a, a, a capitalist, but we need the private sector to come in and play an active role in contributing towards the development of renewable energy so that it can become affordable technology in the average household. Then you will find less consumption of water. For example, you turn open the shower tap and you have a hot water immediately. And it's not expensive having that device pumped into your system. And if we can get down to a 175 liters per capita consumption per day, we can start running safely. At present, we are running at about 200 to 230 uh, liters per capita per day. So we'll have to learn that um, saving uh, practice. But the energy, the, the power outages that we have are a pointer, and you are really on the mark when you uh, ask the question about what is the water situation. And I think th uh, resolving that problem is to a great deal um, using solar energy, and also I would say uh, responsibly using hydroelectric power as well, along with wind uh, systems. Thank you. Um, we, we reach now the end of our session. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Peter Villiers now also to close our symposium this afternoon. Uh, if you allow me to give the, me the opportunity. I read uh, an article, I was overseas the last uh, eight days and on the flight back, read an article about uh, open access publishing and how you really can um, make sure that you can improve the quality of uh, research in the open, says, uh, open access uh, platform. And the core argument that was so convincing is that uh, if open access publishing, like we have with this example of the work of Yuan Temple, is scholarly led, uh, then we are on the right track in terms of open access publishing, in terms of the academy. Uh, the vision for this was Pierre de Villiers. And uh, from my side, my gratitude for his vision to bring scholarship to the publishing world on the open access platform. Thank you so much, Pierre. And you are going to uh, end our session for this afternoon. Thank you, Andres. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, we are at the end of our session now. Maybe it's a good time, Johan and Paul, to inform you that IOSIS is not only an open access um, organization, in other words, sharing and unlocking knowledge without payment to access. We actually also put our money where our mouth is, and we're also a green neutral company. At the moment in Cape Town, we don't use any water in our offices buildings. Everything is collected by, from rain. And we also have introduced uh, solar panels, so we're feeding back energy into the grid as we stand here today. So we are very proud of that. Um, <laughs> thank you. First of all, I would like to, few, uh, to thank a few people before we go away. Professor Filwe Paswana Mafuya, who's not here now, but I'll convey this later to her again, for making it possible for us to hold the event at Northwest University here today. And I think you will agree with me that the facilities here is of an excellent standard. Uh, I want to thank our authors, of course, our editors and the reviewers, our editorial boards, who all worked very hard to maintain the quality of our publications. I want to thank the staff of houses for the production of the journals and the books. They are not here, but they watch us on the live stream. 
our speakers today, Prof. Filwe, Prof. Arde, Prof. Tempelhof, Dr. Roberts, to all our viewers who dialed in via live streaming today. I want to thank the AOSIS marketing team, Eureka and her team, for all the arrangements of this event, and I think it's worth that we give them a round of applause for the excellent work that they've done. I also want to, to, to thank our external vendors today here, providing for the multimedia and the catering. Catering, Krista Galli, Flowers, Seattle, MSM Productions, and Toro Pop-Up Barista. I hope you enjoyed the coffee. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here today and sharing with us the success of our authors and our editors and our staff making this open access project of OASIS such a big achievement. Thank you and drive safely home. <laughs>